Hello, this is Angelica Yingst, and you're listening to Centered, grounded conversations about the metaphysical. Blessed April, friends. It's Angelica Yingst, and I'm here with your April tarot and earth medicine reading. So March, how was that for you all? Yeah, I know. It was a little lion-like. We're shifting, friends, and transformation is not always easy. We're going through some big changes. <laughs> and as I often say, quoting a sponsor who's probably quoting something she read, the ego doesn't always know the difference between annihilation and transformation. So if you hit and bottom, honey, don't dig. Look at this as a solid foundation to start building up, okay? You don't have to keep going lower. You don't have to keep digging. If you feel like you're hitting a bottom, you don't have to go like, how can I make this worse? Just stop. Okay? Just rebuild. Okay? Build up. Rebirth. This is the time. Because astrologically speaking, March brought some significant astrology that will affect us both personally and collectively, not just in March, but as we move forward. So let's recap without taking too long talk about March. And I say that because I'm kind of hoping March is in the rear view, but I have a feeling with some of these astrological shifts, March is like a trailer hitched to our truck. We're going to be trying to drive away from it, but it's coming with us. So let's just kind of recap what we're carrying around. So for the first time in five or six years, we experience Saturn through the filter of another planet that isn't associated with Saturn. So it's Saturn moved into Pisces. Now, Saturn had been in Capricorn and Aquarius, which are ruled by Saturn. And Saturn loves a boundary. Saturn loves a rule. And Capricorn and Aquarius are quite comfortable dealing in Saturn because they're ruled by Saturn. Pisces, on the other hand, is Jupiter and Neptune ruled. So this is a time of like a little bit fluidity which could be hugely relieving after the rule box that we've been in. Kind of like, um, you know, you're relaxing after a long day and taking off your bra if you have boobs, unlike me. But it also could feel too, totally destabilizing for someone who, say, loves rules. I'm not talking about me, but I am kind of talking about me. I like to know where my boundaries are, and Pisces does not like boundaries. And now in Pisces, Saturn is kind of holding hands with Neptune. Pisces is ruled by Neptune as well. And Neptune is the celestial body that governs creativity and dreams. And Neptune is the Roman god of the sea. So Poseidon, if you're a Greek mythologer, mythologist, uh, I don't know what I'm saying, but they love exploring, right? Imaginations and dreaming. And in the same token, Neptune really can be the guide of escapism. Like, hey, come over here. Don't feel that feeling. Come get lost in a sea of like drunkenness and avoidance and Netflix binges and whatever. So Neptunian energy is often like the energy of the ocean itself. So it's magical, mysterious and dark and... When things are at its worst, it's super scary. And the color of the sea and the color of the sky aren't really different when you're lost in the sea. So you can get really lost. So, you know, in, in its best moments, though, Neptune can help us loosen up a little bit. And to kind of find what is our dream and how do I center it? And that's kind of what, you know, we're bringing in with Saturn into... Uh, April. So we're just saying, don't get too attached to rules. Don't get too attached to um, ideas like this is what's supposed to happen because that shit doesn't work here. Okay. So while we might have some, you know, structure in mind, Pisces doesn't really dig structure too much. And then on March 23rd, Pluto which is the planet of power and wealth and shadow, entered Aquarius, which is a sign 
concerned with humanitarianism and systems that organize people and information. And Pluto has been in Capricorn since 20, 2008. And we know what happened in 2008, which is like a huge financial meltdown because the systems were being used against itself, right? Like, oh, yes, you can borrow money like this and we'll have this, you know, these changing, um, you know, adjustable rate mortgages, right? It just, it was really like greed eating its own tail like the Ouroboros. So while Pluto has been in Capricorn, we kind of understand uh, more about how the financial systems are organized. And, and so Capricorn organized that. So Pluto and Aquarius is like a paradigm shift. And Pluto will retrograde back into Capricorn in June. So that's happening. But the last time Pluto passed through Aquarius was 1777 to 1797, a period that was all about revolutions, okay? So Pluto in this system-minded air sign might end up really transforming how we think of our system or how we um, think about information. We may even see a kind of political shift. And that's why astrologers and everyone's losing their shit right now because we've had these two really big shifts happening. So Saturn, um, you know, has moved into Pisces from Capricorn and Aquarius. And then Pluto moved into Aquarius after Capricorn, which was since 20, 2008 to 2023. And then we'll, you know, have a little bit in Aquarius, and then we'll go back to Capricorn, then we'll go back to Aquarius when it comes into direct motion again in 2024. So, you know, when it moves into Aquarius for good in 2024, it's going to be there for two decades, okay? So I think, like, when astrologers are making this a big deal, it's a big deal because these are astrological shifts we're going to be in for a while, okay? So when we're kind of looking at April, we have a lot fewer astrological shifts, but we're still riding that wave of transformation, okay? So the, there's, the first eclipse of the year is in this April, and the second Mercury retrograde in an Earth sign is happening. So a lot of times, like when we think about eclipses and we're starting eclipse, eclipses are happening, we have an unpredictable atmosphere. Things are shadowy. And Shani Nicholas, like, I don't know if you guys read this last eclipse season, but she's like, I don't go out and do stuff. I don't go put my crystals out, put moon water out. Like, I don't do anything during the eclipses. I don't want to capture that energy. That energy is chaotic. So one of the things that, you know, we have to do in April is just kind of like continue to, first of all, enjoy that nothing's retrograded until it's retrograded, which is later this month, for the first time in like almost three months, which is great. But we're going to begin the month. Of course, the sun's in Aries, which we love, and Venus is in Taurus. So the, like Aries loves to be in the sun and Taurus is ruled by Venus or Venus. Yeah. Taurus is ruled by Venus. So they're their natal planets, right? Which means they love being where they are. And so we get to use that energy. So it's like the sun is exalted when it's in Aries. It can capture that solar energy. It is creative and vital and it's going to be here until April 20th. So keep using that sun energy, that solar energy and then Taurus in Venus is a great combo. Weird dog noises made me had to pause for a second. Sorry about that. So, okay. Mercury enters Taurus on April 3rd. So, you know, when, when Mercury's in Taurus, we have that, like, Taurian way of communicating, which is often very honest and gentle and loving, nurturing, um, but also serious. So um, we have that. And our first lunar event in April happens on 
April 6. But it happens at 12.34 a.m. on the East Coast. So that's 9.34 p.m. on the 5th, just so you know. This is the full moon in Libra. So Libra is also ruled by Venus, and Libra is the sign basically of balancing, you know, so it has the scales as its symbol, but it really is about relationships. And when we talk about relationships, we talk about basically balancing the, the me and the other, okay, which helps us really work with that myth of separation, you know. And, you know, because Libra has a reputation of being, getting kind of stuck in seeing all the sides, so it gets a little bit of analysis paralysis because everything seems a little bit right when explained correctly. You know what I mean? So, you know, it does have the reputation of being a little, how do I say this, <laughs> codependent and wishy-washy, Okay. And I don't mean, you know, that's one of the wonderful things about Libra. Libra is like the most charismatic and likable of signs because they do kind of make you feel warm and comfortable. Anything ruled by Taurus is a seeker of comfort, okay? Taurus, or anything ruled by Venus, sorry, is a seeker of comfort. So Taurus and Libra, they both are seeking comfort. Now, Libra does it by making peace and creating, you know, a sense of comfort. Taurus does it by creature comforts. It's, it's very earth-based material. Loves good food, loves a warm blanket, loves a good movie, you know? So let's talk about this full moon. This is a full moon in which we have to put ourselves first, and that's not always comfortable for Libras. <laughs> We're going to have to, like, leave the people-pleasing at the door. And part of that is because the sun is conjunct Chiron in Aries, which reawakens, like, our bruises, our inner wounds. So since uh, mid-February... The wounded healer, Chiron, wanted to really be paying attention to our relationships and the things happening in our relationships, especially when they are codependent. Okay, so in the full moon on April 6th in Libra, we're kind of looking at balance and um, peace and codependency. So if you are prone to that, <laughs> um I think it's about kind of thinking about yourself first. What do you want? And then, you know, if you do have an estranged relationship, great time to fix that. If you want more love, friendship, relationships in your life, it's time to call that in. So we're kind of embodying the principles of Venus, okay, which is about, well, Venus is Aphrodite. So it isn't just about sex, even though Aphrodite gets that reputation. It's about beauty and walking the beauty way. Okay. So if your relationships have been really difficult right now, this is a good time to make peace. Okay. And the sun is going to be connected to uh, the asteroid Chiron, the wounded healer and Jupiter. So Jupiter is a planner, but it also helps with like luck and, um, kind of dreams and wishes and, and prioritizing what you want to be and show up in the world as, okay? Now, April 11th is a really important day. It's the day that astrologers are calling the luckiest day of the year, and that's because the sun is meeting up with Jupiter, the giver of good fortune, and it expands. You know, Jupiter is the biggest planet in the system. Jupiter is named after... Zeus, you know, so I, I use the Ro Roman, so our planets are named after the Roman gods, and a lot of people know the Greek gods, so to translate them, you know, there's kind of a, an equivalency, okay, just so you know. Um, so in astrology, Jupiter rules spirituality, rules higher learning, it rules luck, it rules um, abundance, and so April 11th is a great day for kind of working with what is it that you really want? Let's move it. Let's move into it. 
So um, there's a total solar eclipse that's happening on April 20th. And then again, it's the very wee hours of the morning. So it'll be 12, 13 a.m. Eastern time. So it's April 19th at 9, 13 p.m. Pacific time. And it's the first eclipse of four in 2023. This is very different than the eclipses that we experienced in 2022. And that's because everything's shifting into this Aries Libra kind of axis right now. And so we're going to see the eclipses happen in Aries and Libra. Okay. So the new moon occurs at 29 degrees of Aries. And that's usually like a important number, 29 degrees. It's like, like a karmic degree. And because of that, there'll be a new chance, like a chance to plant new uh, seeds, so to speak, and kind of let your dreams rule. Um, and so, you know, eclipses have an unpredictability to them, okay? And they often will kind of, throw in some shadow, throw in some, I don't see everything clearly, but it feels chaotic, bringing new unexpected changes. It's like it pumps everything up to the 10th degree. So, you know, eclipses are often can shock us. Something will happen around the eclipse and be like, what the heck? Um, so just kind of remembering that because we're still in Aries and we will be until the 20th for sure, um, Let's just like try to be an Aries for a while bit, <laughs> be really courageous and uh, like just like don't let the turkeys get you down. OK, then Mercury retrograde in Taurus happens because then the sun moves into Taurus on the 20th and on the 21st, Mercury goes into retrograde. And again, this is the second Earth uh, Mercury retrograde of the year. We're having one in Virgo and then another one in Capricorn. We had one in Capricorn when we started the year. So, you know, Doris is pretty, it's a fixed earth sign. So it's pretty cautious and grounded and all that stuff. So when Mercury are, is already in Taurus and it's direct, it's already slow. So when it's retrograde, things just come to a halt. So if you're waiting to sign like, contracts and stuff really just wait till afterward okay because everything is going to take three times longer or not happen at all if we try to push it during this retrograde so just wait it's okay to wait you can just wait um so that's kind of the astrology of april and so i pulled some cards of course i pulled a card for the month and we're just continuing our string of major arcana cards because um you know, this has been a, a spiritually important time, astrologically important time, and the major kind of deal with deep spiritual issues. So we're kind of welcoming in the strength card, the number eight of the major arcana and strength kind of arrives with this gentle, radiant beauty of the goddess. Um, and she connects with the earth, with wild things, with the wild parts of us. So when we walk with strength, we're asked to think about what strength means to you both as a virtue and a quality. And because of that, we become intimate with the virtue and quality of strength in our life. You know, in the Middle Ages, strength was called fortitude. And this was one of the four cardinal virtues. And in this way, because it was the Middle Ages and everything was very focused on what separates us from the animals, God and faith, and so strength was seen as overcoming your animal desires for things like sex, gluttony, anger, addiction. And that was a, you know, a virtue. And so, you know, the lion also was seen as a symbol of Christ and the golden light of Christian mystics. So if your strength looks different than that, that's cool. That's how my strength looks too. But not acknowledging the history of these symbols would be a mistake. Strength often feels like wobbly legs and puffy cried out eyes. And, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, those of us who have had hard times and hard lives, we get up and do the next thing, 
next right thing, next thing we have to do anyway. You know, it's that medicine of um, fear, the medicine of courage. You know, without, without fear, courage doesn't exist. It's just a doing then. And so strength comes in often um, like a great huntress, you know, who stalks her goals and stalks her loved ones and, you know, comes in with like intensity and love. But it can also be um, putting up boundaries with compassion and love, detaching with love. It can feel like masculinity with short one word sentences like no, or I will not do that. Or it can be filled with opposition and raised fists. But more often than not, you know, strength is really at its peak when we hold back, you know, when we're not giving in to the anger and the violence and we're kind of walking with a, um, a kind of confidence in who we are. So the goddess protects what she loves. She protects all living things and she does it without weapons and without armor. And in this card, you see her with the lion and that's really important. The fact that she's coming in almost like the mother, like mother earth showing her love and vulnerability and her feeling. And it's the paradox of this card that it's a woman on the front because women have always traditionally uh, be, been seen as the weaker, right? The weaker sex. That's not at all what is the truth. And we all know it because women give birth, right? The goddess strength is in her fear and vulnerability and the fact that she walks through her emotions without shying away from them. She feels it. She acknowledges it. She deeply uh, grateful for it. So strength nuzzles in her great lion nuzzles in because it doesn't need her to protect, you know, it doesn't need the lion for protection or to bear his teeth or to parade his power to feel the command that she wields. You can never forget that the lion, of course, has this great power and animalness. It, it is built into its idea in our society. But strength, the goddess, the, the quality, the virtue, is asking us how do we hold our strength? How do we hold our power? Are we displaying it and and moving into that bravado or are we holding back because of compassion and uh, gentleness? You know, we don't have to always wield our lion. So strength asks us to remember how much weight we can hold, how much power we have over others. Strength asks us to think about our own animal selves and what we do to punish our own humanness. You know, strength is passion. And it's our animal nature and it's our wildness and it's our refusal to be um, tamed out of our emotions. So it honors us as humans, the full range of us. And because we feel the full range of emotions when they come up, it doesn't come out as, you know, tearing flesh, right? So strength wins over fear and strength is how we decide to practice self-love and self acceptance strength is about how you stand as you say to yourself i'm ready for transformation because strength births transformation and the strength card is like my personal life path card and it's a very powerful touchstone for me i think one of the important things when we work with a card as a touchstone for the whole month or as a a card of the year or card of the month is to remember that Oftentimes, we're not just like, oh, I get to be strong all month. It's that we wrestle with the issues around strength, okay? So someone like me, for example, I have strength as a personal life path card, and so does my identical twin sister, okay? But we ha approach strength at a very, in very different ways, okay? My sister has more issues asserting herself, whereas I have issues not asserting myself. <laughs> so, you know, it's like they're both the same coin. So strength 
shows up for us sometimes as feeling incredibly vulnerable, like we can't do things, feeling totally hijacked by fear and anxiety. So if you're like, well, I have a strength life path and I don't really understand it in my life, think about the way that you've wrestled with both the feelings of having power and being powerless. Think about the ways you've been victimized because strength comes in for victims as well, okay? Now, I use one of my favorite poems by Adrian Rich, and I've said this poem, I think, on this podcast before, but it's a place I let myself find reprieve because this is exactly uh, how I see strength and when we play with it. And it goes like this. It's, it's from Sources, and it's from the book Your Native Land, Your Life, and this is how it reads. I refuse to become a seeker for cures. Everything that has ever helped me has come through what already lay stored in me. Old things, diffuse, unnamed, lie strong across my heart. This is from where my strength comes, even when I miss my strength, even when it turns on me like a violent master. God, I love it. It's my strength. It used to always turn on me like a violent master. Do not accept help. Do not ask for help. Do not be vulnerable. You know, demanding, demanding. So let's talk about the earth medicine. Okay, we're coming back. Let's go to earth medicine. Um, so our plant medicine this month is magnolia. And magnolia trees bloom right now. They bloom in early spring and they bring with it a blooming of our own soul paths. You know, there's a kind of opening there. And magnolia trees are a genus of tree that contains about 200 plus different flowering species of plants. And it was named after the French botanist Pierre Magnol. Uh, one thing that I find absolutely cool about magnolia trees is that they're very old. So the oldest magnolia trees are 20 million years old. There's fossilized magnolia trees. And that's like before the evolution of bees. So magnolia trees, basically the magnolia flower is adapted to allow pollination by beetles because of that, which is so cool. And magnolias have large fragrant flowers and they're, they're really big and often like either you can see them as star shaped or they're like a bowl. Um, and the flowers come in all these different shades of white, pink and purple and green and yellow and, um, in the deciduous species of them, the blooms will appear before leaves in the spring. And the flowers are considered edible. In parts of England, the petals are pickled and used as a condiment. In some Asian cuisines, the buds are pickled. Um, but you're not supposed to use it um, if you're pregnant. There's some uh, contraindications, so please, please look it up before you do that. But it's used in Asian cooking and uh, in Japan and um, so there's just a lot of gifts of magnolia and uh, magnolia's gift in earth medicine is to prepare you for big shifts again transformation so we got all these transformation guides this month so this is an ally of allowing things to unfold and not fighting we're also not sabotaging. <laughs> We're just like letting things happen the way they're supposed to. Like think of that bud and how it opens up. And when it starts to open, everything looks wrinkly and like it's not going to be very nice. And then it unfolds into this beautiful flower. And so, you know, Magnolia kind of reminds you that you are always you through all your lifetimes, through your past lives through your childhood, your uh, teenagehood, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 90s, your 80s, every incarnation, the core of you is still there. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but um, when my kids turned six, I got really excited because I've heard that six is when you're the most you. So if you have a six-year-old and they're just like the sweetest little... Ugh, that's who they are. Their core is there. And if you think of time like folding in on itself, you can access the past, present, and future through that core of you because it's been in every single incarnation. And you can also heal all those parts of you, all the hurts, 
reclaim any lost parts. Magnolia reminds you that time is an illusion, but it's also transitory and passes quickly. You know, Magnolia is a great plant ally to promote wisdom and transformation. One other thing about Magnolia is that the flowers contain both pistils and stamens, meaning that they are um, and androgynous. They can uh, propagate themselves. So um, it lends itself to like a beautiful magical quality of kind of understanding abundance, growth and fertility as within the self. Okay. Self-reliance. It's also uh, anti-inflammatory, um, which is really resonant for me right now and in this inflammation flare that I'm going through. Um, but it's really good also for banishing work, for baneful magic and protection. And a lot of this stone medicine that I pulled this month, I mean, all of the stone medicine I pulled this month, which I pull, I pulled uh, Naisha Asian's cards, um, and those cards I love, um, but... She's not practicing. She's not in this realm anymore, but I still love her cards and I still use them. And I pulled them and they're all protective. So we are also going through the transformation and uh, protective energies. So I want to tell you the three stones and we'll talk about them a little. So amethyst was the first one, then hematite and black tourmaline. They are so good together. Okay. Amethyst, hematite and black tourmaline. They just resonate really well together. So let's start with amethyst. Amethyst is probably the most popular, easily obtained crystal. Um, and, you know, you, everybody is probably familiar with crystals, even if you don't know crystals. You know, working with amethyst is one of the things that kind of draws you into crystal world because they're, first of all, very beautiful. And they range from like pale lavender to deep purple. And now... There's a pink amethyst that has been uncovered that is just uh, so gorgeous. It's almost like this dusty rose color. It's considered an amethyst instead of a pink, um, like a rose quartz, because of the way it grows. It grows where amethyst would normally grow. Um, so amethyst can go even to the very deep purple, almost black. We call that black amethyst. That's very, very protective. Great for nightmares and stuff like that, but... Uh, amethyst is a quartz, so it's a silicate. Um, it's uh, got a most hardness of 7, 7.5. It resonates really beautifully with other quartz stones, including citrine and clear quartz and smoky quartz. And you'll find these stones like ametrine, which is amethyst and citrine together, or smoky amethyst. I have a lot of uh, illustrials that are smoky amethyst. Um, so it, it really res resonate with all these other quartzes. Um, it's said to be the ninth stone on the breastplate of the high priest of Israel. Um, and amethyst is one of the stones um, where each of the 12, uh, it was one of the stones where each of the 12 tribes were written. Um, in medieval times, soldiers wore it as protection on the battlefield. And even as far back as the Neolithic era, so that's 25,000 BCE, amethyst was found in archaeological digs as part of great sites and ritual. And through the common era, amethyst was seen as a stone of royalty, and it was used in crowns and rings with kings and queens. So amethyst's name actually is derived from the Greek word for drunk, with, which is methustos. And actually, amethyst is the translation of a amuthos. Uh, the ancient Greek wore amethyst um, and made wine glasses out of amethyst because... Um, they considered it a stone of sobriety. They thought it would prevent intoxication, so they would drink the wine out of glasses made out of amethyst um, because it is considered a stone that balances the mind and brings clarity. It also is very calming and helps relieve frustration. Um, so it is worked on um, that level of like uh, acceptance and addiction, so people work with it for... Uh, all stages of alcohol and uh, drug addiction recovery. The belief of amethyst power of sobriety probably stems from a myth of amethyst in ancient Greek mythology, um, which may or may not have derived from a French poet. So we don't know if it's actually ancient Greek mythology or kind of came up with um, by this French poet, but 
Um, in his poem, I want to say, Le Amethyst, Au Le Amor de Bacchus e Amethyst. Amethyst or the love of Bacchus and Amethyst. Um, he invented a myth, maybe, uh, which Bacchus, the god of intoxication and wine and grapes, was pursuing a maiden named Amethyst who refused his affections and she prayed to the gods to remain chaste, a prayer that Diana, the goddess Diana, who was a virgin goddess, answered and he transformed her into a, or she transformed her into a white stone and then humbled by her desire to remain chaste. So Bacchus poured wine over the stone as an offering and it dyed the crystal purple. So various stories include and variations include that Dionysus had been insulted by a mortal and swore to slay the next mortal who crossed his path, creating tigers to carry out his wrath. And the mortal turned out to be Amethystos, um, who was on her way to pay tribute to Artemis or Diana. Again, Bacchus and Diana are the Roman names. Uh, Dionysus and Artemis are the Greek names. So Dionysus wept tears of wine in remorse for his actions and the tears stay in the courts purple. Um, so there's all these kind of stories of this young, beautiful young woman named Amethystos. Um, but because of its association as an anti-intoxicant, it was also said to prevent the intoxication of love. So priests and monks wore it as a symbol of their vows of chastity. Um, and in Tibet, Buddhists even used amethyst in prayer beads and carvings. Um, you know, amethyst is a really beautiful meditation ally. And it resonates in the crown as well as the third eye. It's very protective I encourage people to use it um, for protection right along with black tourmaline and smoky quartz and hematite. It enhances intuitive ability. It's a great dream stone. Um, amethyst is really great in any room. I love how accessible it is to get a cluster of amethyst and how beautiful it is. And it's really just great to have like as a centerpiece in a room and it purifies, it's high vibrational, it's clearing, it's acceptance. It has a wonderful high vibration and it works well with others. So it's great in grids and um, it really does work on that level of uh, helping with addiction and protection and healing and emotional balance and um, using an amethyst in each hand when you're having a panic attack or having a PTSD trigger can be really good at bringing things down for you. I use it in my healing sessions. Um, I just, I just love amethyst and you can find all kinds of different amethysts like Chevron amethyst and celestial amethyst. And of course there's wonderful um, formations of amethyst that everybody loves. Um, so our next stone is hematite. Now, so much of my crystal healing arsenal is kind of made up of grounding stones. And that's because I'm a very earthy person. It's just really vitally important to me. And I started realizing this when I studied crystal uh, healing and, and earth medicine, it's that our connection to mama earth is so very important for helping us shield and protect our EMF, our electromagnetic field. So not just for like empaths and people who are very sensitive, all people have this, you know, be, are affected by other people and being mindful of our very delicate auras, and our very delicate vibration can be very helpful. So hematite is one of the most effective grounding stones. Um, and it's very accessible. It's easy to find. Now, if you're, you have, you're like, I have a bunch of magnetic hematite, Angie, that is not hematite. It's hematite, but it's ground up, put together again and, magnetized hematites maybe a little bit naturally magnetic not enough to even pick up a paper clip so hematite is not magnetic what it is is an iron oxide and it's actually named after the greek word for blood and part of the reason for that is when hematite is not polished it's not that silvery metallic look it's actually red like like dirt like clay um and so it becomes metallic looking when it's polished. 
um, almost like a gunmetal silver. And it's an awesome balancer, grounder, purifier. It resonates with the root chakra, with the earth star chakra. I place it on the hips for grounding and in my hands. Now, you know, our earth core is iron. So it's wonderful to kind of have that connection to the earth's core. Hematite is really great for electromagnetic, uh, like I should say, low frequency electromagnetic disturbance and pollution through electronic devices. So if you're going to put something in front of your computer, hematite or black tourmaline are my go-tos. Um, they're really good. Um, anything ferromagnetic, meaning iron um, bearing, basically, are going to be good for EMF pollution. Uh, but hematite is really a great shielder of EMF pollution. Um, it helps with a lot of autoimmune disorders with polarity issues that stem from electronic overload. So if you are someone who works in front of a computer and you're not working with hematite, today is the day you get to change your life. <laughs> Grounding is very important. And um, when we're working in front of the computer, it's really important to kind of bring it together. Now, hematite is a stone of integration. It has light and dark and the highest self and the shadow self, male, female, spirit, body. And when we have like one of integration, it's basically bringing polarities together. Um, and in fact, that's kind of how we think of manifesting. You know, we're kind of bringing ourselves into alignment. And so it's wonderful for that too. Um, hematite's a quick grounder. It's a long-term grounder. It nails us to reality. Keep some in your pocket for that. Um, it's great for intuitives. A lot of people think um, that when you're doing psychic work, you just need high vibration stones. But grounding stones can help you process and understand what you're getting when you do psychic work. And it works really well with black tourmaline, our other stone of the month. And black tourmaline is my go-to for protection. Garnet and black tourmaline and hematite, they're all, they're all my, my go-to's. Um, but black tourmaline is wonderful for energy workers, therapists, uh, teachers, social workers, customer service people, anyone who deals with people. Because black tourmaline is basically the stone that I recommend more than anything else because it's a grounding powerhouse. It's an uh, energetic cleanser and purifier. It helps with EMF. It has piezoelectricity, so it does that work. So when I'm in a healing session um, and I do an energy scan, I'm also grounding that person, okay? And I'm doing that with black tourmaline. That's my go-to. When empaths, intuitives, and compassionate people kind of engage with the outside world, highly sensitive people, we absorb that energy. And so black tourmaline is kind of your shield to not get so affected by other people. So if you're working with hematite and black tourmaline, and amethyst together, that's like a dream team for protection, which is great. So for me, it's probably the most important ally I have. Um, and it's awesome for, um, for working with transmuting energy. So I grid my house in black tourmaline. I grid my yard in black tourmaline. I grid myself in black tourmaline um, because it is, you know, often said that it can um, transmute. Now, what does that mean? It means one energy comes in and it neutralizes it to, to just neutral energy, okay? It's not like it takes it and be like, blah, 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 out. It's part of it is because of the piezoelectricity. You know, we're giving it a high amplitude or low amplitude, low, I should say high amplitude, low frequency energy, like grumpiness and whatever. It takes it in and transmutes it and changes it to just be neutral. So we don't have to experience it as negative. So it resonates with the root chakra, the earth star chakra. Um, and it's just wonderful for gritting. It's wonderful for, Wearing it when you're doing healing sessions, my healers. Um, place it between your feet while you're working. Um, just all of those things can be really helpful. It's good for banishing work, for um, clearing work. It's good for uh, detaching negative attachments. It is a purifying, grounding, and centering stone. And all three of them really work together. 
beautifully. And I happen to have all three. I think I might put some little mojo bags together for April. If you would like to buy one, check out my website and I'll put some little mojo bags with all this medicine together. So our next earth medicine is our animal for the month. And our animal for the month is raven, which I am so excited about. I actually had a client who had raven this month in March, I should say. And uh, I was like, I have not done a journey with Raven. So I'm very excited to be, re- first of all, revisiting Raven wisdom and medicine. Um, I did work with Raven um, for voice because that's what my um, teacher used Raven as. So I did a um, Raven uh, intensive with voice. But, you know, Raven's wisdom is uh, introspection and magic and the keeper of secrets. It's a master magician and a shapeshifter. And it is like the guide of mysticism. Um, so Raven is a very large blackbird and it's big. A lot of people are like, that's a Raven. I'm like, that's a crow. Uh, Raven and crow often get confused, but Raven has a very distinctive beak and it's the largest songbird in North America. They're very intelligent. They're clever mimics and they actually can develop their own, uh, vocabulary. They can talk. They can be taught human words. Um, they understand uh, animal language. Um, and a lot of Europeans, like early Europeans and um, folklore says that raven um, were bad omen because they feed on corpses. But the truth of the matter is raven, like other part scavengers, they're not 100% scavengers, but they 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 are feared because they're around death, but they're actually really, really intelligent. So they're, they're black, but they do have like a glossy iridescent plumage. And sometimes you'll see um, like tones of green and purple. And a lot of times people will confuse those, will confuse grackles with ravens, but they, because they have similar feathers, but they're, they're not the same. They do have a wing wingspan of almost four feet. And so that's what's surprising when people see an actual raven. They're like, whoa, those are big. Okay. So there's a lot of myth and mystery around raven. Um, raven have a power of speech. So they open up the throat and they help you find your words. Um, and raven has that like mystic role of being an oracle that can tell the future. So you'll see a lot of like, raven showing up in different um like oracle decks or or tarot decks because they were considered a raven and they revealed signs and they were a messenger from the spiritual realms in celtic mythology ravens associated with morgan with the morgan morgan is a goddess known for prophecy and she can shapeshift into raven um and then delivers important news and when she bears news to the battlefield she will collect the souls so they don't have to remain with the enemies raven was also connected with the welsh king bran the blessed um and he was also the power animal and the animal of odin and um so raven becomes really important in norse mythology and um so uh, odin was accompanied by two ravens which is hugin who wielded the power of thought and searched for information and Mugen, who wielded the power of the mind and intuition and his daughter, the Valkyries would shapeshift into Ravens to gather and bring information back to him. So the ancient Greeks associated Raven with Apollo and Athena. Okay. Because they were the deities of the sun and the light of wisdom. So um, there are some myths that say basically that, Um, Raven was the one that, uh, found the sun, you know, so Raven was white and, um, basically pulled the sun, uh, into, so I I think it's a native American myth, um, that Raven was the bringer of the light and that everything was dark. And then Raven went to find the sun and, um, give humanity like wisdom, Um, And so he pulled um, the sun into the sky and that's how Raven became black because Raven was white and then got burnt by the sun. 
Um, but Crow and Raven do share some um, like earth medicine uh, attributes. And so, and that's like that visioning and um, prediction and the magic and all of that. Um, and Raven is one of those that comes with transformation. Okay. And so of course we're working with a lot of transformation this month. And so Raven is coming in for that wonderful uh, energy. And so Raven is that kind of guide to help um, move into and accept shadow parts of ourselves and um, to kind of work with magic and, and mystery and, um, return to the light and bring the light with you. So um, thank you so much for coming with me on our monthly journeys of um, astrology and earth medicine. Um, I'll be talking more about the earth medicine this month. Throughout the month, I'll try to post some little tidbits. If you are in my membership group, you will receive a shamanic journey with Raven this month. Um, and we'll talk about the medicine of Raven a little more in depth and kind of go uh, deep with some of the other uh, medicine. So thank you. Um, you'll also be getting, if you're part of my membership group, a reading at the full moon and the new moon as always. And then we'll do some bonus ones like with the eclipse and, um, you know, Mercury retrograde. Who knows what's coming up? I fly. I go with the flow like Pisces. And anybody who knows me knows that's bullshit, but I try. Have a great month. Thanks for listening to Centered with me, Angie Yinkst. If you'd like to send me a question or comment about this show or any shows, you can send them to angie at themoonandstone.com. 